what I had today is what I didn't know That jams and food can really put you down God is such a very bad way So exactly what we do when we're making me Makes all the difference between it or he Gotta wash my hands every time I slice Gotta wash my hands every time I jump Gotta wash my hands every time I cook Gotta wash my hands Keep it safe, keep it clean, bacteria can be me. People trust us with the lies, children, husband and wives. Their health is in our hands. From the east to west, across the land. Keep it safe and clean. So that's the point I say, gotta give it, give it all today. Have to watch what we do, have to watch the way we do. Record show the proof from a foot hand clown. I must not go if my clouds hit the roof. Don't make the whole heart a hope and pray. Only paperwork will save the day. I watch all the temperatures, so I watch all the danger zone. Gotta keep it cool, gotta keep it hot. Gotta keep the food just okay. okay. So that's the point I say. Gotta keep it, keep it all today. Have to watch what we do. Good day. It is most often people that are transferring bacteria from one place to another. We as humans provide a cozy host that bacteria like to grow on because of our warmth and moisture. So what exactly are bacteria? Now our intestines also rely on certain bacteria to break down food so that we can properly draw nutrition from what we eat. So as humans, we do benefit from helpful bacteria, but that is only certain bacteria, and they have to be in the correct place. There are, however, other bacteria that are harmful to us. These bacteria use us as hosts to grow nicely, and then they may also be passed on to other people. But in the meantime, we can get very, very sick, and sometimes even die from these harmful types of bacteria. We are told that we live with bacteria all around us, but we can't see them with our eyes, so how do we know that they're there? Well, we can test for certain bacteria in a laboratory using special media that allows the bacteria to grow to levels that will enable us to see them, so we can count how many of them were in the original sample. I am here at QPRO International with microbiologist Letitia at their laboratory that can test for the presence of any harmful or spoilage bacteria. Hi, Letitia. Hi, Duke. Tell me, what are harmful bacteria or bacteria that can spoil our food? Well, bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, Salmonella, or Bacillus are harmful bacteria, mm -hmm. and we like to call them pathogens. Right. Now, if those bacteria are anywhere near or on the food, then there's a very high risk that the person who ingests that food will become infected. Mm. So it's a simple case of logic, really. Right. So in our labs, we like to test for these bacteria because it allows us to inform our clients if they have contamination at their premises. And if there is contamination, then we know that there's a problem with the hygiene there, and that something has to be done immediately in order to correct it. I see, but apparently bacteria are everywhere. Yes. W would you say that I've got some? I mean, I see myself as a clean guy. I wash my hands after using the toilet and I'm not sick. So why would I still have to be extra careful if I had to go and make food now? Well, as a scientist, I like to work with evidence. Mm. So let's have a look and see if you have any evidence of bacteria on you now. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, would you like a forehead or a hair sample? I think let's start with your hands first. And why do we do that? Well, it's your hands that would come into contact with the food initially. Mm -hmm. and and thereafter your hands would come into contact with your hair or your nose or your eyes for that matter. Okay, okay, I get okay. the picture. So we're going to take a swab of your hands mm -hmm. and thereafter we're going to put this swab onto this dish. Right. And the dish will be put into an incubator, which is basically a cozy moist room that will encourage mm -hmm. the bacteria to grow. Right. Because bacteria need 
life-giving conditions the same as we do. We need food, we need water and moisture, the correct pH and temperature, as well as a bit of time. Great, so that will definitely take a bit of time to... Yes, it will. In another 48 hours, we'll take a look at this exact dish and have a look at what bacteria has grown. In particular, we'll be looking for staph, or which is more correctly known as Staphylococcus aureus, mm -hmm. which is a very common bacteria that grows very quickly in our incubators at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, great. Is there anything else, Letitia? Well, before you go, Duke, I'd like to conduct a quick experiment with you, if you don't mind. Okay. If you could do me a favor and just rub the special lotion into your hands, please. All right. Here we go. Takes a bit of time. There, there we go. <laughs> just give that a good rub for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, it feels good. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> now, when you're done, Duke, what I need for you to do is wash your hands as correctly as possible, please. Okay, I'll go do that now. Okay. All done. There we go, all done. Squeaky clean? Oh, well, I think so. You sure? Almost sure. <laughs> Let's have a look. Using this special torch, which also emits UV light, I can show you all the little places that actually you've missed. See, if we look at your hands carefully, can you see that? Yeah. All the nooks and crannies that you actually didn't get to. Particularly around the jewellery, which is exactly why a food handler should not be wearing jewellery. I see. So with the short demonstration, I actually just wanted to show you how important it is to not only wash your hands correctly, but to also sanitise them mm. before handling food. Fantastic. Great. In the meantime, let's get back to the workplace so we can get a better understanding of the different types of contamination. The types of contamination that we are interested in are physical, chemical, and bacterial or microbiological. Physical contamination occurs when, for example, an unprotected light bulb breaks or bursts above some open food, then particles of glass will fall into the food. It may also happen from yourself if a false nail came loose off your finger into the food you were handling, or your hair falls into the food, or your jewelry falls into the food. It can also happen if utensils are damaged and bits of wood or plastic can get into your food. Remember to be careful when covering or packaging food to make sure that bits of packaging do not get into the food. Chemical contamination is when food becomes contaminated by chemicals that are used in and around food storage and handling areas. To avoid such chemical contamination, we must make sure that we don't store any food in an empty chemical container. In this example, residual amounts of a possibly poisonous product are now entering the food. Vice versa, we also mustn't store chemicals in a food container. In this example, the staff member who knows what they've done wrong Better talk quickly before the patron gets a handy, handy white sauce. Remember that if pesticides are present in food preparation areas, there is also a chance that these poisonous chemicals could get into our food and make somebody very sick. These are examples of how accidents happen. This is why we need to take care with the storage of chemicals and ensure that all chemical containers are clearly labelled. Chemicals must also not be stored next to food or food packaging or food containers. A good practice to avoid these types of situations is to make sure that chemicals are not stored in close vicinity to food products and ideally should be stored in a separate chemical storeroom. We have seen that our environment, our cells, and many raw foods naturally carry different types of good or bad bacteria. We need to reduce the risk of spreading bacteria as much as possible. All good practices promoted in this training series are also designed to reduce microbiological contamination. We can do this by following safe food handling methods. For example, when working with raw meat, 
chicken or fish. We should have a dedicated cutting board for this. That is a cutting board or boards that are for this use only. Boards used for raw vegetables should not be used for cooked products, for example. To assist us to identify these boards, it is good practice to use a color coding system for the boards so that we instantly identify which is which. A guideline poster such as this one will remind staff about which board to use for what product. Regardless of what colors are used, all cutting boards and utensils should be sanitized as a last step in the washing process, as well as between uses. Color coding of cleaning equipment is also a very good idea to limit the risk of spreading harmful bacteria from high-risk areas like toilets into our food preparation areas. These harmful bacteria may catch a ride on our cloths and mops unless we use separate cleaning equipment. We will learn more about this in our sanitation and cleaning module, so look out for that. Another way to prevent bacterial contamination is to separate your high-risk areas. For example, one area to be used for raw meat, chicken and fish handling, and another separate area for salad preparation, pastries and other things. The condition of your utensils is important. Wood. Wood is a porous substance. That means that it can easily absorb things such as blood and other contaminants. Therefore, it is recommended to replace wooden items with plastic or stainless steel utensils. Wood also splinters easily, so food debris and dirt can build up in these splintered areas, causing bacterial contamination. All food storage equipment must be maintained in good condition. For example, there should be absolutely no rust anywhere. Did you notice all that rust? Look at the build up here. These rusted fridge racks must be replaced or the fridge refurbished or entirely replaced. Perishing door seals are also a no-no since we can't clean these areas properly. And in addition to that, the door can't seal properly to keep the cold air inside. Inspect all items. For example, a utensil such as a food grater is at risk of an accumulation of food debris that can become difficult to remove. This is a perfect place for bacterial growth. Therefore, clean such items well and replace any broken utensils regularly. A good habit for storage is to store clean utensils and small equipment in a clean, dry environment where air can circulate easily, so that bacteria can't be left to grow peacefully and undisturbed. For example, cutting boards should be left in an upright position, separated from each other so that the air can circulate and they can dry. Not flat like this. Here, everyone keeps using the top boards and the bottom ones get ignored while slimy bacteria is building up. This is bad practice. These bottom boards will never get dry or stay clean. This kitchen's head chef reminds his staff to make use of the vertical storage racks that can hold their cutting boards in an upright position with an air gap in between so that they can dry nicely. These containers will never dry out hygienically. Turn them upside down to drain properly. This is good practice. Utensils standing upright to drain well while the air is circulating. The large items are hanging out of contact with other items. Bowls and dishes should be stored upside down. Another way of controlling contamination is to pay attention to the control of waste. Make sure that dustbins are clean and sanitized regularly, 
are lined with a plastic disposable bag are emptied frequently, have a close fitting lid. If it is not a foot pedal bin, then the lid should be kept off during busy times to avoid excessive touching. But the lid must be kept on and the bin closed during quiet periods. Ideally, we prefer lids that are foot operated. Bins may be kept in the food production area, but they must never be used as a work surface or improvised table. Not like these uninformed people are doing, using the bin as an extra bakery table. Waste bins should be clearly distinguished from ingredients bins so they cannot be mistaken. In food production areas, always keep exposed food covered to prevent unwanted contamination. Fruit and vegetables come from farms located all around the country. Many people have handled them on their journey to your kitchen with a high risk that they have picked up bacteria in the fields or somewhere along the way. If you are preparing these foods to be eaten raw, such as in a salad, it is important not only to wash them before use, but also to sanitize them to reduce the risk of any bacteria. Make sure you use a food approved vegetable sanitizer at the correct dilution for this use. Only the correct dilution for the correct exposure time is acceptable. Washing or soaking in salt water is insufficient to properly kill bacteria. Pests such as insects and rats are ideal carriers of bacteria and are therefore dangerous if they are allowed near our food. If pests or evidence of pests is noticed, it must be reported to the manager. Make sure that the pest control contractor is regularly visiting the premises for pest control. Every part of the food preparation area must be able to be cleaned, even behind posters and notices. Keep doors and windows closed or screened to prevent flying insects entering the premises. No open bait or even secured toxic bait boxes are allowed in any food preparation or storage area. Bait and domestic insecticides contain poison that can make humans very sick, especially if some of it gets into food. An unnoticed child could accidentally have contact with pest control products. Think carefully before you place pest dispensers on the shop floor. No use of domestic pesticides is allowed, as these are poisonous. So imagine spraying this poison and some of it getting into food or even rodent bait somehow finding its way into your food. If insecticutors are in place, ensure that these are not directly above any food preparation surface or area. These should ideally be placed at entrances to avoid flies being attracted inside the area. Insecticutors must be serviced and cleaned regularly by the pest control contractors. So, we see that people can get ill from bad habits and food handlers just not being careful. Other practices such as overusing oil can also make customers very ill. Oil undergoes chemical changes as it is heated to high temperatures. After a certain amount of use, it builds up high levels of toxic elements that are poisonous to our bodies. Therefore, always test your cooking oil with a test kit. This test will indicate whether the oil is still okay for use or not. Here the worker is testing a sample of the oil against a colored chart. As you can see, this oil is no longer suitable for use. This worker is using a test strip against the test strip evaluation guide. 
In this case, the oil can still be used. Remember to always record these results on your oil log sheet. Always dispose of the old oil in the proper legal way. It is illegal to throw oil down any drain. It is illegal to sell or give away old oil to staff, customers or beggars. Old oil must be collected and handed over to a reputable company who will ideally recycle it for uses in other industries not related to food, such as cosmetics and biofuels. This company will be legally accountable to not use the oil for any animal or human food production. After special processing, it could be used to make biodiesel, for instance. Cooking oil used too much or for too long is transformed into a poisonous-like product that has been linked to cancer. In many industries, and particularly in the catering and hospitality industries, it is a good idea to keep retention samples. Letitia, what happens if a guest at a hotel or a restaurant gets sick and blames the institution? I mean, how is blame or responsibility apportioned? If the guest could have gotten sick elsewhere, such as eating a burrowers roll at a street vendor? It's a very good question, Duke. That's exactly why establishments such as hotels and restaurants like to keep what we call retention samples. Retention samples? What are those? Well, every day, 80 to 100 gram samples of high-risk products, such as mints or chicken livers, are kept aside from every meal serving, such as breakfast, lunch, or supper. Mm -hmm. And those samples will be kept in a fridge or freezer at below 4 degrees centigrade for about three days in clean, sanitized containers that are clearly dated and labeled. So if there is a query or question, basically the establishment can call us and we will collect the samples for the date in question, mm -hmm. bring them to the lab, and test them for any bacterial contamination. And the results will actually determine what further action needs to be taken. So in that way, an establishment can take, can do a thorough investigation and take corrective action if necessary, if the food was contaminated. The investigations allow caterers to demonstrate their willingness and commitment to serve and provide healthy and safe food because ignoring the problem isn't going to make it go away. Great. So, but in, in the same, sorry to interrupt you, but in the same vein, you know, if the food was not contaminated, it reassures a customer that they were not made ill at that establishment. So this process gives peace of mind to all parties involved. Exactly. So that is quite a broad area that we've covered. We've seen that bacteria like to grow in the same ideal conditions that we also like to live in. We've seen the different types of contamination. We've seen that it is important to develop good habits for handling food in storage and food preparation areas, all designed to limit the risk of contamination. We've seen that it is important to keep all poisonous products far away from food, and that includes old oil. We've also seen that we must look out for pests. We've seen that there are procedures for keeping retention food samples in the hospitality business. Well, Letitia, 48 hours have passed since we took the sample from my hand. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious to find out if you find any bacteria on my hands. Well, Duke, if you have a look at this sample, you can see that there is definitely bacterial growth. Mm -hmm. It looks like staph, but the only way to be sure is to actually do a coagulase test. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start that off by, first of all, sanitizing our hands, mm -hmm. which is very important, as you learned. <laughs> the first step is to be able to drop a little bit of our agent onto this little board. Mm -hmm. And now what we need to do is take a scraping of the actual growth from the colony. So here we go. Okay. Now, the only way of telling that this is Staphylococcus aureus is you'll start to notice small little white clumps that will start to develop okay. in this agent. They're very, very tiny but that's how you know that the little colonies are starting to group together. You'll slowly start to see them form. Can you see? Yep. Oh, that's how we know that you definitely had Staphylococcus aureus on your hands. Oh, so there's proof that I actually had bacteria on my, I actually have bacteria on my hands. Yes. But where does it come from? I mean, I wash my hands after using the toilet and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, 
anyone could be carrying it, including myself, right now. The truth is that staff could exist on your skin or in your nasal passages, but it only becomes a problem once it actually gets into your tummy through mm. ingesting contaminated food. So if right now you had to go and prepare us a meal with your contaminated hands, oh. <laughs> you would not only run the risk of contaminating the food, but also of us ending up with food poisoning. Sure. So the golden rule of personal hygiene is then to always make sure that you've washed your hands correctly and sanitized them before handling food. And to practice everything we've learned by studying these modules, of course. That's good. Well, thanks for watching. And remember to look out for all the rest of the modules on how to excel at the QPro Food Safety Audit.